Thank you so much, Marie, for praying for me. Love, being fluent in a love language, that is something we can likely all do some work with. And there can be many different languages, and I believe there's plenty to say about them. Pastor Jess has included a lot of good thoughts about love these last several weeks, and Pastor Clayton has extended love to us the last seven plus years. And I hope I've given love because I have definitely received a whole lot of love from all of the Heston Mennonite Church community. There is so much one could say about love, but let's let our scriptures guide what nuggets we consider today. The first passage that Daryl read for us comes from the book, The Song of Solomon. Now, there are many images of love as two lovers describe their passionate love for each other. And I'll leave it up to you to read more of the book. But this passage that we heard can be one way that God expresses God loves, God's love excuse me, for us. That God desires to live deeply inside of us in our very hearts. That God loves us passionately and fiercely. And not even the worst flood can drown out the love of God. This passion reminds me of another verse found in Hebrews 10. It is verse 24. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds. That phrase, provoke one another to love. It's intriguing to use the word provoke in the same sentence as love. I often think of it in relationship to anger, provoking anger. But in the NRSV, it is used to encourage us to encourage each other to love. Somehow it gives strength and motivation. It is this motivation that Jesus also encourages when he gave the disciples the commandment to love each other. It wasn't a suggestion. Well, he gave them the commandment to do it, not just a suggestion or encouragement, but a new commandment. Because if people saw how the disciples loved each other, Jesus says, they will know that you are my followers. I can remember reading in a seminary class how early Christians were known for the care that they gave others, particularly those lying dying in the streets during plague. Others would shy away from them, but the Christians embraced them and cared for them. It was a real witness and evangelism tool, so to speak. Brothers and sisters, not only for early Christians, but it is also a commandment for us. Notice how we are urged to love each other as an outflowing of our love for God. Because of our deep love for God, we ought to work at loving each other. No ifs or whens, just love each other. So a question for you. Have you heard the words, I love you, but I don't like you very much? I've wondered what that means, and I'm sort of landing on, it means, or it might mean, I will care for your physical needs because Christ has asked me to, but wouldn't choose to hang out with you or call you when I need someone to talk to. Another perspective I have heard is love does not have to equal trust. Again, I can do my best to love you as a Christian brother or sister, but I don't have to trust you or maybe simply I don't trust you. I think I'm going to let that go. (laughs) So what do you think about these two distinctions? I'm still ruminating, considering, thinking about them in my head. And so if you have ideas or thoughts about that, feel free to uh, talk to me about them. I'm open. 
To learn more about love and the language of love, let's turn to what is well known as the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. We would be remiss to not address this chapter on February 14, which falls on a Sunday, so Valentine's Day, of course. Today we heard the first seven verses. These words were written by Paul to the church at Corinth, but they are for us today too. These verses are wonderful descriptions of love. But Nyswander, who wrote the Believer's Church Bible Commentary on 1 Corinthians, says, In almost all English English translations like the NRSV, the characteristics of love on the list are in the form of adjectives. But in Greek, they are verbs. This means that Paul was not describing qualities, but rather actions of love. Not how love looks, but how love behaves. Love is a verb. There you go. Listen to how 1 Corinthians sounds different using verbs as it is written in the message version. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Wow, love is kind of amazing. Friends, you've heard the encouragements the last number of Sundays to love each other, love each other, but how? How do we love or show love to each other today or tomorrow or during a pandemic, especially when temperatures are below zero? Well, my brothers and sisters, let's face this challenge. Let's provoke each other to love. And one way to do this is to take the time, the opportunity we have right now, to begin learning each other's love languages. The idea of love languages comes to us from Gary Chapman, who wrote a book titled The Five Love Languages. The book was aimed primarily at relationship at a relationship between couples, but he has since written a book about the love languages of teenagers, a book for children, a book for singles, uh, one for appreciation in the workplace. There may be others. I, those were the ones I found. But I invite you to Google this and do, excuse me, do some studying on your own. For our purposes here. These are the five love languages Chapman describes. Words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. I'm going to give you a really brief explanation of each one. Some are fairly self-explanatory. Words of affirmation involve comments that build each other up, express appreciation like, thanks for starting the car so it warmed up. That pie you baked was delicious. Thanks for all the time and effort you gave to do that. Thanks for the book you recommended and sent to me. It was awesome. Kind words. Humble words. Second, quality time. Giving someone your undivided attention. Now, that does not mean sitting on the couch and watching TV together, because when you're doing that, you're giving PBS, ESPN, or the Hallmark Channel your undivided attention. It does not mean the quantity of minutes, although there is something to that. It is quality minutes. 20 minutes of undivided, focused listening can go a long way. No earbuds in, no phone in your hand, or even within your reach. Really, isn't there very little that can wait to be addressed for 20, 30, or 40 minutes? And quality time does not always mean talking. It can be working on a project together, or going for a walk, 
or a bike ride. Third, receiving gifts. And I'm wondering if for Megan and Marie, receiving those gifts of boots and jewelry, if that was really a very special love language for them. Because gifts are visual symbols of love. It often doesn't matter what the gift is. What matters is that it was thought of and there was follow through to give it. Gifts do not need to cost a lot of money, or any money for that matter. Making a card, giving some favorite cookies, or giving just one flower might cost more in time than in money. Four, acts of service. Doing things you know your friends or loved one would like you to do. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Now this action had all kinds of meaning associated with it, but one of part of that meaning was love. Acts of service are doing things for or with others. One might think it is in the DNA for Mennonites with all the projects we have been involved in or started over the years, but not necessarily. If it is in your DNA, thank you. Thank you for all the acts of service you have done. Last one, physical touch, fairly self-explanatory. For those whom physical touch is their primary love language, the last 11 months have been particularly difficult for the simple reason that we have been asked to remain physically distant from each other. So folks, have not only been able to receive physical touch, they have not been able to give physical touch. And that way of communicating is uh, what they're used to doing. To express love in other ways has been, well, okay, but not as deeply meaningful for them. I've heard once or twice or more, I just can't wait until I can hug again. For someone who has said that, it's a good indicator that physical touch is a primary love language. You're wondering, hmm, I wonder what my primary love language is. Well, here are three ways you might be able to discover that. One, what does your spouse or a friend do or fail to do that hurts you most deeply? So the opposite of that might be your primary love language. Two, what have you most requested of your friend or loved one? That is likely the thing that would make you feel most loved. Three, how do you regularly express love to someone else? That may be how you feel loved. Dr. Chapman says, love is something you do for someone else, not something you do for yourself. But let me add, that when you do something for someone else, you often reap the benefits. When you, Grandma, bake cookies for grandson Johnny, Johnny receives your love and your care, and you have the opportunity to pray for Johnny while you're baking. And then you're able to spend time with Johnny as he eats your cookies, or maybe it was a whole different scenario, and you bake the cookies together. So your challenge this week, find out the love language of those closest to you, your family, those in your bubble, then branch out a little bit. What about those in your Sunday school class or your group of friends at school or who lives down the hallway from you at the villa? What about who you work with, your supervisor or someone that you work most closely with? Here's another hint to finding out another's love language. People tend to criticize others most in the area where they themselves have the deepest emotional need. Hmm, just something to chew on. Friends, every language we can think of can be a love language to God. When we do say, think in ways that are pleasing to God and loving towards each other, we are expressing our love to God. Two stories of love to share with you today. 
One of you shared a story with me about someone they know who has figured out a way to help a family member anonymously with their house payments. They make contributions just as they can. They don't do it every month, but as they can help, they do it anonymously. And now a second story is going to be shared with us by Jim Brenneman. Yeah, um, last Sunday we were, had the opportunity to have a visitor come to our church. And um, it happened to be right at the last few sentences of Justice Sermon. And um, it was pretty um, noticeable that this person may need some um, help. So I had the opportunity to uh, talk with this person and uh, visit with them for probably 15, 20 minutes. Uh, learn their story of losing a spouse uh, to lung cancer um, without medical insurance, so um, left with nothing, and um, needed a warm place to stay last Sunday night, uh, preparing for a job interview on Monday. Um, so I just want to thank you as a church that this building felt open to someone to come into our church. Um, I felt blessed because you guys called me as an elder, and she request, this person requested a um, deacon elder or pastor. Um, and the other thing is, I see so much of this going on in our church as an elder that many of you are doing that. I get to be, to be hear the stories because of the um, mutual care that you guys supplement and that Everance most of the time matches. We have a, quite a bit of money and we've had quite a few meetings where how much should we give because our, our amount's getting low. And we've always said give because we know our church is gonna refill it. So thank you for the blessing I got. I had a great opportunity to talk to Jess and uh, Kay both about the blessings I received from that opportunity. But um, thank you as a church and all you members that um, made this place where somebody came off the street needing help. Thanks so much, Jim, for being willing to share that. Friends, we all need love. And I trust we are all capable of giving love, giving and receiving, speaking every language of love that we possibly can. And we take turns giving and receiving, and that is okay. Now, one part of love that needs to be named today is the difficulty to love when we are angry or when we've been hurt or when we've suffered trauma or abuse. First, I'm so sorry, and I pray that this, if this is you, someone will come alongside you and gently, carefully, in a way that is comfortable and healing, will show you love. And then I pray that after time, you might find one way to extend love to someone else. And then maybe after more time, one more way and then more time, another way. There is no specific timeline here. Healing takes time. But thank you again, sisters and brothers, Heston Mennonite and beyond, for all you are doing to show love to others. There are ways, there can always be more ways to love, but thank you for what you are already doing, for the groceries you are buying each other, for the food you've made and shared, the pictures you've posted that have pointed to God's creation and brought encouragement and joy to others. The cards and letters you've written and sent each other. The pages you've colored and sent to someone to brighten their day. The phone calls you've made, the texts you've sent, the prayers you have prayed on behalf of those you know 
and those you don't know or may never meet who are on the other side of the world, but you are called to pray for them because God loves you, and so you are asked to love others. Thank you for the money you've given to the CARE Portal, the Mutual Fund, the Heston Resource Center, lots of different helping agencies. It's important. Because God loves us, we also ought to love one another in every language we possibly can. Love pulls us all together, never apart. And once we learn to speak it, all the world will hear the love that we can think of in every language we're working at. We're doing our best to become fluent and to be spoken here. Amen.